Can I ask you all now just to spend a minute or so uh, detailing how your particular region's hospitality industry has been affected by COVID-19 specifically? We have had a uh, very different issues in, in all of these countries. And let me explain. Canada has taken more of a traditional approach of a uh, review, uh, analyze, uh, impose certain restrictions and lock down Canada was behind the United States in terms of uh, COVID uh, infections. However, over the past two to three weeks, they have caught up very rapidly. So this is a very uh, interesting situation that's happening there. A little bit different in Central and South America. Central America, the various countries took different uh, different ways and procedures in, in which to, to look at this. Uh, I'll give you an example. Up until about uh, a week ago, Mexico was very uh, uh, lenient with some of their uh, practices. Similar in Central America, but most of the Central American co- countries, including Guatemala, Honduras, have taken a very uh, strong approach right from the beginning and have locked down and separated uh, civilian populations, closed all businesses. And when I say this lockdown, I mean not only for civilians, but for the uh, commercial sector as well. South America, very similar. Each country is a little bit different. And if you look at the world map, uh, our members in South America are telling me that very different stories. Brazil has increased COVID infection very rapidly. They've gone into a total lockdown in all sectors, civilian and commercial, and uh, they're trying to fight this right now, but with limited resources. Similar in Chile, uh, by the way, most of these countries now are, have imposed martial law. From midnight to 5 a.m. in the morning, most of the military patrols the streets. Various other countries in South America have various degrees of lockdown. It's safe to say, though, that 90% of them are in total lockdown with martial law. Um, I think that's a that's an overview. Eric, can we get the U.S. perspective, please? Uh, yes, here in the U.S., uh, it's kind of a patchwork approach. It seems uh, the federal government has kind of overseen the entire response in terms of supplies and uh, determining what assistance can be given to individuals, small businesses, and large corporations. Um, the one thing that hasn't been consistent is the shelter in place or lockdown orders. It's all up to each individual state at this point. Um, my personal opinion on that is I think that's a terrible approach. I think a comprehensive approach to our entire country would be the right way to go with this. Um, but that's, like I said, just my opinion. Um, in terms of our business and the food service and hospitality sector as a whole, um, Restaurants are virtually at a standstill. Um, the only thing happening is the takeout and to-go orders, and in certain areas, that has even been uh, stymied now. Um, and we're seeing the cascading effect through all food service in the U.S. Uh, because of these lockdown restrictions and work-from-home restrictions at this point. It's very interesting in our part of the world. You've got uh, the Asian countries uh, that uh, it's it's a cultural the cultural uh, factor that kicks in here, where the people typically uh, are subservient to the government. So the government's a rule, and the government say, this is what you've got to do, and they do what, what they have to do. And as a result, you've got places like Singapore, Malaysia, and others, India, that have uh, really done well in the way they've controlled the, 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 the virus. And as I said, it is purely because people have faith in those governments and they've done what they've done. China is a, is a different kettle of fish. They've had their, the, the, the origin of the virus there. They've done whatever they've done to get over it. Um, but I think the one that I want to signal out of the Asian countries is, is some, someone like Singapore, where uh, you know, they took really early uh, steps, right? You know, this was like six, eight weeks ago. They, they closed all masses. They closed the restaurants down. They took the, they took the hard steps very early in the piece, and they have reached, uh, reaped the benefits today. And when it comes to New Zealand and Australia, again, New Zealand, you know, we uh, take the mickey out of them for for different reasons. But I tell you what, uh, you know, hats off to their prime minister and to the country. In their whole country now, uh, when I checked this evening, they had only 772 uh, cases of, uh, you know, the COVID-19 in all of New Zealand and only one death in the whole country. 
in Australia, again, where our continent is such a large continent, we've got only 5,315 cases in all of Australia and only 28 deaths in the whole country. So we are blessed. My own state of Western Australia, where I am in, it's a big state. As you, some of you know, the good old Margaret River region, the Swan Valley and everything else. The, the, the premier of the state has now divided even our, our own state into seven regions and then cordoned off each region and you can't even go from one region to the other. Great. Thank you, Mario. And Ramco, finally, can we get the, the view from your region, please? I think our government uh, um, uh, does really good. Um, uh, I feel comfortable with how, 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 they, how they act, uh, the steps they uh, do uh, day by day, uh, week by week. And they have not chosen for a complete lockdown, uh, but they, they make uh, the whole the 70 day, they, they do the responsibility. They ask to, they, uh, the 17 million people to take the responsibility. And that means, um, we are not in a lockdown. Uh, for sure, all the restaurants and food service, everything is closed. Uh, take take out is open, and um, I see a lot of creativity in uh, in restaurant business uh, uh, that, that comes up by bringing meals at homes, but also bringing meals to those people who can't afford it anymore or anymore because of they lost their jobs or they have no money. So uh, the solidarity in in our country is 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 getting to a very good level. I think. Uh, you wish you wished it, it was it was before already, but this is something that uh, that is happening at this time. Um, by not locking everything down, uh, there are still uh, shops open, uh, uh, and they uh, uh, they have rules. You have to keep distance, and uh, they have chosen for a kind of uh, immunity uh, uh, construct. And it seems to work in the Netherlands. Yeah, I I I, I, I have the feeling that we are in control. But anyway, I'm also, I'm not in the hospitals. And I know it's very, uh, the situation there is very bad. It's worth uh, just giving a quick, uh, I guess, UK perspective. Um, we're, we're hosting this uh, round table on the, on the 3rd of April, uh, where I think the worldwide cases have, have tipped into a, into a million. In the UK, we've got 33,000 cases of confirmed cases of COVID-19, 3,600 deaths. Um, and it, it feels like it's in a period of kind of escalation still, big shortage of uh, testing for frontline staff and a big shortage of ventilators as well. So it's a very critical period here in the UK. It feels like it's uh, sort of either spiking or kind of about to hit and that the whole government process is about flattening the curve at the moment. Obviously all these different measures that you talk about from around the world, they're, they're going to have an impact on every single business and every single sector. There's no doubt about that. Um, but for you, Personally, and in your own business, um, what what changes have you had to implement, and and how how quickly have you had to act? From a business perspective, at Clevenger Associates, we're a mainly uh, design focused, with some MAS uh, involved as well. But on the on the design side, we haven't seen a drop in business, um, and we also haven't lost any projects due to the um, COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, some things have slowed down significantly. Uh, one good example of that is the uh, education sector. Um, since schools are not in session and essentially closed until April 30th at this point, we're not able to meet with key staff or school boards um, to keep projects moving forward. But so those have slowed down a bit. In terms of our working remotely, um, we have been so used to using Skype and Zoom for meetings for, I don't know, the last couple of years that it hasn't really had a big impact on us. Um, we kind of just, you know, went right into that with no problem. We were all used to that. And it was kind of a, a business practice that, uh, that had already been established with architects and design teams since they are scattered throughout, you know, the U.S. and the world. Dealing with clients hasn't really changed. The one thing that we're noticing is that we're not hearing from a lot of clients because they are at home right now or, um, or just managing their crisis personally or, or with their business at this point. I think we've seen the same thing. We haven't had that much of a slowdown. However, in two sectors of our work, namely sports and entertainment and healthcare, things have started really ramping up instead of down. Uh, and the reason we believe Obviously, on the healthcare side, we understand some of the issues related to 
you know, healthcare is in the forefront all over the world now and, and what we're mm-hmm. going to do and how we're going to do it and new facilities have to be built. And certainly in North America and other parts of the world, it's been exacerbated, uh, the need, so to speak, by this uh, virus. However, the ownership groups of, of large franchises, professional and some high-level amateur, as well as the authorities, the public authorities that govern them, all understand that this is going to pass at some point. And when it does pass, there's going to be a pent-up demand for people to get out of their homes, to go back to the sporting world, to spend whatever money they need to spend to, to enjoy this, to get some levity in the situation, some relaxation. And so these, these owners are, are really still uh, pushing to get projects completed somewhat on time. I just thought I'd make that observation because it is unusual in this particular situation, but it does point out that every industry sector is a little bit different in how they view the cost benefit of what's going on. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, Renko, I'm interested to hear how this has affected your business with the sector you work in. We are in healthcare, eh? so this is where everything happens at the moment. Um, Specifically for our business, uh, we have uh, facility, hospitality and real estate uh, consultants. We are with 40 uh, people. And when I look to the business for food and hospitality, then my concerns are getting bigger and bigger because um, the, the healthcare, the elder homes uh, and the hospitals, they are in a lockdown. You, you cannot even visit them. You can, the projects we were doing, they are, um, they are done for this moment. They will be picked up after, after COVID-19 uh, uh, somewhere. We don't know when, but uh, definitely a lot of uh, uh, customers of ours have said, okay, for this moment, we need all our hands uh, on board uh, in the hospital to get the business done. Uh, it affects our business. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we are trying to do good things for our customers by helping them and by helping them in, in, in liver, delivering hands. So we say, okay, can we do something else for you for free or for, uh, for a special rate or something. And in our country, um, the WebEx and the Teams and the Zooms are now in a very quick way uh, introduced. Uh, as you were speaking, Eric, in, in your country, it's already normal, but uh, yeah, we t- actually, we did this now by incident. Sometimes you have a meeting by this, these kinds of uh, systems. And this is, this is taking a really big flow. So that's, if you say an advantage, it's a kind of an advantage because it can be very efficient. Although yesterday I was for seven hours after uh, watching watching a screen and talking to people <laughs> at meetings, uh, yeah. it's, it's not my uh, favorite thing, but it, but it works. Mario, it'd be good for to to, to look uh, to hear from you actually as to whether or not you feel not trying to take any positives from this at all. But do you think there are any lessons that can be learned from this experience, or any sort of um, uh, good practices or best practices that can be picked up when we emerge from the other side of, of the crisis. Is there anything to take from that at all, from, certainly from the, your learning so far? Yes, absolutely. This is our opportunity to show a bit of goodwill and uh, reciprocity to our clients. So we are actually now offering small little complimentary services that we can do to help them uh, while they're doing it tough. And, and they're really appreciating it. And I think these are the things that when the times turn around, that they will realize that, you know, when times are tough, mm-hmm. these guys were there to support us. And some of the things that we don't do normally, that we're suddenly thinking, wow, this is not such a bad way to do s- uh, certain things. But there are some of the things that we're doing now externally from home. Um, even like one of, my, one of my staff, you know, he drives 45 minutes into work. And now that he's at home, He's, uh, and I know in other parts of the world, they travel even longer, but in, in WA, that's, that's a long time to travel to work. But, you know, just saving that time and for him to have that flexibility from mm-hmm. home to do what he can do. Where before it was a nine to five job and that's when it was, the, all of a sudden now that level of flexibility, the give and take with your staff, with your clients is creeping in. And I think it's a great thing. Uh, it, we, we've done it. Uh, it hasn't hurt us, hasn't broken us. This made us stronger, and uh, we'll probably look at embracing it uh, in the future. Let's look a little bit to the, the future. Um, maybe a question for, for Bill and Eric to pick up. Are, are you 
positive for the, the, the quick recovery uh, that the food service sector will take once the crisis is curtailed? It, do you, does it, it may look pretty bleak uh, in the situation we're in right now, but are you positive it's going to come back quickly? Will it come back strong? Um, unfortunately, I do not believe that in North America it's going to come back very quickly. I think it's going to take a little while. Uh, the astounding statistic that was released yesterday, and Eric will, I'm sure we'll talk about this, is that the um, current unemployment is over 6.6 million Americans, and that's reported. We believe that is close to probably 8 million, uh, which has never in the history, even the Great Depression in the United States in the 1930s, there has never been a situation where unemployment has been so high. Um, and it's going to take time to ramp up. And quite frankly, uh, the general consensus in the commercial sector is that many of the small independent restaurants, uh, clubs, bars, etc., may not make it. I mean, it's going to take a long while. It's going to take two to three years, in some cases, to sort all of this out. Some of the large companies, um, most of them are looking for some bailouts right now, but this is an unprecedented situation. Um, and uh, we have, uh, many of you have heard, uh, you know, a two, a three, actually around $3 trillion uh, bailout package. Now they're talking about another two to three trillion US to try to bail out uh, individuals, companies, et cetera. And there's, there's now again, some infighting starting within the government. Uh, Eric mentioned, you know, the individual states and their rights to govern. Uh, we have bigger issues as it relates to our government, our federal government, and the two, uh, to the two parties, and the swords are rattling again. So this is not a good situation. I wish I could paint a better situation, but it's not. And in Canada, same thing. Uh, Trudeau, some issues with his government, with the various parliament members, and that remains to be seen as well. So, Eric, why don't you take from this point and see if you, you know, I'm sure you can expand on it. Sure. I think, you know, I'd echo your statements on the small independent restaurants. One statistic that I saw was as many as 30% are probably already not going to be able to turn the lights back on and, and operate. Um, in terms of a quick recovery in some of the other market segments. I could see um, the corporate world, um, the healthcare industry, as Bill mentioned, you know, some of those essentials when people get back to work, um, I could see those segments quickly returning. But as an overall, I, I don't see it happening. Um, we did have an economist give a presentation to uh, the allied industry associations here in the Americas. And the economist said, he was very optimistic that this would be a, a very sharp downfall and a very sharp return. But as Bill mentioned, we're hitting unemployment numbers that are astronomical that we could have never imagined seeing, at least in my lifetime, I didn't think I would see it. Um, and one issue now is that the government is not moving fast enough with the stimulus packages. I know that there is a stimulus package right now for small businesses, it's $350 billion but they're already saying um, that today was the day that you could put your application in and would cover payroll for eight weeks as well as uh, rent, utilities, and mortgage for a small business. But they're already saying that that is gonna be um, overrun with applications and they don't think that they can support the, the infrastructure isn't there to get the money out to the people fast enough. Um, we also have so many people applying for it that $350 billion will probably go um, maybe halfway to where it should be. So I'm assuming you don't share the economist view that there will be a sharp downfall and a sharp return then you think it's going I to mean, take far longer? Maybe in the stock market, if you're looking at that as an indicator, but in the, um, you know, cities and towns and small operations, restaurants, I, I don't see that at all. Well, uh, Mike, I can say that, you know, for us in our region over here, again, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, in the Asian, re Asian region with the culture. Uh, fortunately, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are two parties, but predominantly there's one. And then, you know, in some parts of the, some parts of there is either 
either you shut up or they or they put you aside basically you know what i mean and you just got to live with it and at the end of the day sometimes uh those type of rule uh actually in in these circumstances in particular actually work uh and they will work in asia and they will turn it around places like singapore malaysia india um china is already turning it around uh, only bigger pl- other places like indonesia might struggle and and in our own country in australia we are very blessed because uh, there are three key initiatives that our government has implemented uh over here which is really uh, helping the economy and helping it generally and the three things are uh most of the governments are throwing money and saying oh you're unemployed and you know here's a handout and here's a, a two week or eight week check for your unemployment but what the government here is doing the they have the job seeker allowance but what they actually uh, offering now is a job keeper allowance a job keeper allowance so they actually telling the business if you retain that employee and pay him a certain percentage of his wage we will actually pay you that money and you keep that employee in your business the second thing is uh, is uh, daycare which is really important because you know the parents are out there and the healthcare workers have to go to work they've got to put their, you know and they said all the schools are shut and what it is so the daycare centers the uh, parents are pulling uh, people out of daycare because they lost their jobs they can't afford it and the last thing is that they put a six month moratorium on tenants and saying landlords you can't evict a tenant for six months and they're offering the landlords also some uh relief but um, you know that gives the the tenant some certainty during these times i think in some way i always just look at the glass half full and look at what would happen in the future and to me it is in the hospitality industry whether it's the restaurants cafes and other things like that uh it's uh you know people that have not been in an industry like uh, ourselves that have gone and done apprenticeships and worked behind the behind a stove and worked in kitchens and worked in behind counters and run places and people that have come from other industries you know sometimes they're doctors dentists or they've taken a package from somewhere else and they said oh, I'll open a small cafe or I'll just take my redundancy and buy a small bar or do something you know it's easy just easy money these are the type of people that will will find it difficult to come back in there and actually this the ones that have have you know rolled up their sleeves and been in the game mm-hmm. and know what it's about and how tough it is to run businesses they are the ones will survive and the 10 15% of the periphery that uh, don't have that experience but have just gone into the industry because they think it's a good industry to be in they are the ones i think will do it tough and fall away and yeah, what i hope is that um you know um we are uh with a with a group of people uh doing consultancy training and as and mainly training in hospitality yeah and um as you watch to the basics of our training programs we work with uh with fisher you have seen that before i think uh, it's from seattle guys uh, you americans <laughs> and 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 and, and 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 the main thing we learn people is choose your attitude uh, and um play with each other uh, be happy you know and what i and actually when we are doing training programs in healthcare and in hospitals and everywhere we try to uh, to bring people back to um to to normal behavior because um uh, during the last uh, uh, decades of periods um normal behavior has 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 gone away uh, because we are an individual society uh, in the netherlands and i think all over the world and what brings us uh, uh today is that people are getting connected uh, they are taking care for each other they do the shopping for their neighbor uh, uh the neighbors who were an elder people from uh, 50 85 years lives and bring they they bring the the meal but they did not do that before this this yeah. covid mm-hmm. uh, period so yeah the, the, the people are more um um solidarity is that the right word uh and creativity and um yeah they, they are more taking care for each other it's not it's not the it's not the individual but it's us together yeah i would totally agree i think that what remco said is a a key thread that we all hope will we will get out of this situation people working together pe- people helping one another towards a singular goal you know it's interesting we look at at least in north america and i'm sure throughout the world we have a a phrase we've used in design the communal dining table that was put into effect a number of years ago 
And I think the importance of the communal dining table and how we interact as people in the hospitality industry in all sectors uh, is going to be very interesting to see the before and the after. And we're all hoping, and I think we can shape this through our design and through our management advisory services to our clients, we are at the forefront of being able to shape how we think, how we act, how we uh, work with one another uh, in this industry. And that's a huge, huge statement when you consider the net effect it could have worldwide. The main message I would like to convey to our members in the Americas is that we're all in this together. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen over the next two weeks, month. Um, things are so fluid and changing that um, that it's hard to, to forecast where we're going to be in a month. Um, we will continue as a division to provide resources and uh, to be a sounding board for any members that need advice, uh, would like to talk about business, um, pretty much anything that they you know, wanna bring to us, we will be there to answer. Um, we've actually, over the last two weeks here in the Americas, have done two uh, Zoom, what we call fireside chats, where uh, members and allies and industry partners can all log in to a Zoom meeting such as this one and, and answer questions and uh, just have conversations. We're a very person-to-person -person type of industry where, you know, our conferences and trade shows and, and meetings mean so much to us. And to have those taken away, I think, has affected people because we're now lacking that that person-to-person -person contact. Um, so those Zoom, Zoom meetings were a great way to get that back in a virtual way. Um, but the America's Division will be there to support the members in any way possible. And please feel free to reach out if there's anything the association or myself or Bill or anyone else can do uh, for you as a member. I would like to say uh, uh, stay, health, stay healthy, um, uh, help each other. Um, Perhaps we should say now these days, we share, we support, and we help each other. And I think that's it uh, for this moment. One of the things that I've taken from this whole experience is that we take nothing for granted. And one of the things that I've always believed in is in collaboration, uh, that trying to work independently and on your own is good, is good, but working collaboratively with someone else is even better and, and the best thing to do. And FCSI gives us that opportunity really to network with each other, uh, to learn from each other and through the FCSI family I have made so many friends around the world uh, and it has helped not only me it's helped my business I can pass that on to my clients uh, and you know on, on a personal note on a personal note when I say don't take for granted on a personal note uh, uh, my one of my very good friends who I did my apprenticeship with uh, back in the 80s and who is now in America and uh, was a celebrity chef there actually succumbed to the virus and passed away last week. He was only 59. His name mm -hmm. was Floyd Cardoz from New York. And uh, my sister and her husband are both doctors in New York, working 12 hours a day looking after the sick people there. And then two days ago, my brother-in-law collapsed uh, and passed out and they had to get an ambulance in and yesterday he was uh, tested positive for the uh, COVID ID uh, for the 19. And you know what, uh, one of the things that I want to share is that my faith and the faith in God, that uh, this is a time when we've relied so much on our own selves and we've forgotten about God. And I think this is one uh, thing, if I may, I, I know I don't, you know, you don't bring religion, but I would like to bring it in there that that this is a time when all of us have a bit of soul searching to think that on our own we can do collaboratively we can do that but there is a supreme power there that we need to call on and also rely on uh, in our lives uh, to to help us to make it better and to enjoy our lives and i just want to finish off by saying talking with the fcsi family uh, and i want to extend it to my uh, you know to my good friend uh, michele from marino in italy because they're doing it tough there. And I went on his uh, on his WhatsApp sharing something with him and his WhatsApp uh, little uh, thing there said, tough times won't last, but tough people will. Brilliant, yes. thank you, Mary. Sorry, Tina. Well, yeah, I, I guess really all I have to say is that it's, it's super interesting to hear from all of you sort of placed around the world. And 
it really brings home the fact that this really is something that we're all in at the same time. And I know for me, when I feel miserable sitting here working at home, feeling a bit down about it all, I think, well, it, it's the same for all of us. And we have to get through it together. And I think, I think like Remco, we'll come out of this much stronger as a society and we'll look out for each other. Um, and the last week or so, I've spoken to a lot of people in the sector. I've done a lot of interviews. We're trying to run a lot of stories on the website. And it's just so heartening to see how much hospitality is doing for society, for the world. And hospitality is always the first sector to put their hand up and say, what can we do? How can we help? And um, I think that's really lovely to see at such a difficult time. Bill, back to you. As, as, as Worldwide President, is there a final message you'd like to give to, to members globally uh, about de a, dealing uh, with COVID-19, those who work in this sector, but also um, planning for the future? Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to echo what everybody else has said, that the Worldwide Board stands ready to assist all of our divisions, all of our members worldwide in whatever their needs are. We may, may not have the answers uh, immediately, but I guarantee you, we will go to whatever length we have to, to assist our, each of our divisions. Uh, we're one family and uh, we will get through this. We'll be, we will be bigger and we will be better. But I, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows that they can call on us as a board and as united divisions at this time. We're one big family and we will prevail we will beat this and we'll be bigger and better than ever. Mm -hmm.